Okay, this is a continuation of Chapter 6, and first we're going to do a little review. Here we have light viewed as a wave. It has the characteristics of wavelength, which is the length from peak to peak of the wave, and frequency is just the number of peaks that go by an arbitrary place in space per unit of time. In this case, seconds, we call that frequency, which is just one over seconds. And it has velocity, we call that the speed of light in a vacuum, which is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And here's one that we want to pay attention to on this particular occasion, the amplitude or the height of the wave. And uh, that's going to come into play when we talk about wave particle duality. We have the continuous spectrum, which we looked at from long wavelength to short wavelengths, long wavelength, uh, low frequency, low energy, short wave wavelengths, high frequency, high energy, and in the visible part of the spectrum, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet over here. And Newton was actually the first uh, scientist who was able to process uh, white light in uh, a laboratory, process it through a slit, and create this visible part of the spectrum. He was a proponent of a particle theory of light. He called light particles corpuscles. Uh, but the prevailing theory of light was the wave theory. And as we said, here are the uh, characteristics of wavelength and frequency. We know that they're inversely proportional to each other. We can set it up mathematically, solve problems as we did in this particular case. Here's the energy of a photon, which is Planck's constant times the frequency, and we substitute C over lambda for uh, frequency. All right, so uh, let's get to line spectra. So white light gives you all the colors of the spectrum. Uh, and if you combine them, you get back your white light. However, if we take a gas, like hydrogen gas, and we energize it, uh, we actually get discrete frequencies of light. And we're going to equate those discrete frequencies of light with the energy of different wavelengths. So for instance, we have 656 nanometers down here of one of the four uh, detectable uh, discrete frequencies for hydrogen. Some people can see a fifth, but we'll just focus on these four. And that's the longer wavelength in the red region. And then down here on the other end at 410 nanometers, we have a violet uh, region of the uh, visible part of the spectrum. So what's going on with hydrogen that when we energize it, we don't get white light, we get this these four discrete frequencies which each have their own discrete energy level. Well, that's going to bring us to the photoelectric effect which essentially says that shining a light on a metal ejects electrons, increasing the current registered on an ammeter. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to the worst cartoon drawing in the history of quantum mechanics videos. Uh, but here is, in essence, what the photoelectric effect says. It says if you shine a light on a metal surface, and you know that metals, they're made of atoms, uh, they're actually crystalline in form. You've got positively charged nuclei, and then you have electrons which would be surrounding way, way away from the nucleus, 100,000 times further away uh, from the nucleus, and we'll put those on the metal surface. Now, if you shine photons of a particular energy uh, on the metal surface, you can start moving those electrons around, and you can kick them off. Uh, so that they literally leave the surface of the metal. They impact a detector, in this case an ammeter, register a current. So here's the deal. If the wave theory of light is the theory that actually works, here are its characteristics. Big old waves with wavelength and frequency and amplitude, which we really didn't talk about very much uh, at this point. But think of it this way. Here is a boat, and eh, we'll call it a canoe. And if the wave theory of light is consistent with the wave theory of the way water works, 
if you've got a big high wave that has a lot of amplitude, it's going to knock the canoe out of the water. It's just going to swamp it, uh, sink it, knock it out of the water, and we're thinking of it as an electron, so it gets knocked out. But that's not actually what occurs. The intensity of the light, uh, which is the number of particles uh, we could think of consistent with the amplitude, um, it actually doesn't matter in terms of knocking electrons away from a metal surface. So it really doesn't have anything to do with the amplitude. Uh, you can knock more electrons off of the surface of the metal, but they'll have the same amount of kinetic energy when they impact the detector uh, as long as the wavelength of the light is the same. So, in fact, no matter how intense, uh, how bright the light is, it won't make a difference in the energy of the photoelectrons ejected. And that's what we call these electrons that are being ejected from the metal surface. So here is a very nice little simulation of the photoelectric effect that I borrowed from uh, Colorado. Thank you, Colorado. And uh, so here's a metal surface, and I'm shining a light on it at about 50% of the intensity of that particular light. But notice that I'm shining that light on at 577 nanometers, and the wavelength of that uh, particular light in the yellow region is just too low uh, or too long to produce the kind of energy that will move some electrons around, give them a punch like uh, a pool ball hitting another pool ball and kicking that pool ball around. But you can see that if I lower the wavelength, which is increasing the frequency all of a sudden, electrons begin to pop off of this metal surface. And I pick sodium because sodium is pretty easy to oxidize. The velocity that the electrons are moving across the space to the detector uh, is pretty slow. Now, if I increase the intensity of the light, I jack it up to 90%, I don't see the electrons moving at a higher velocity. What I do see is more electrons moving. So this is consistent with the intensity of the light, uh, with the amplitude of the light. I'm getting more electrons, but I'm not getting more kinetic energy in the electrons. On the other hand, I can go ahead and I can lower the intensity of the light to 20%, and I can start reducing the wavelength. And as I reduce the wavelength, I'm increasing the frequency, and I think you can see that the simulation is showing me that the kinetic energy of the electrons is, is higher at the shorter wavelength higher frequency photons that are coming off. And then, just for fun, if I throw it up there at 100% and I really lower my uh, wavelength, increase my frequency, I get a big steady stream of electrons. But again, if I go back and I find what we call the threshold frequency, that is the frequency below which we don't have any emission of electrons. All right, so let's correlate that to my little cartoon drawing here. So turning up the intensity is turning up the amplitude uh, on your light. And that's just going to give you more electrons as long as you have a frequency that's above that threshold frequency. And so higher amplitude doesn't give you higher energy. And the uh, analogy with water waves is here is a little rubber raft, and uh, I'm sitting pretty happily in it. Here comes a big high wave. Well, if the wave theory of light was in effect in the photoelectric effect, I should be just tossed around, tossed completely out of the water by that big high amplitude wave. But that's not what happens in the photoelectric effect. In the photoelectric effect, you can have 
tiny little ripples, in this case, of water that can literally take a cruise ship and uh, capsize it, uh, flip it upside down. So there I am, king of the world. And that literally is the behavior that we see for light in the photoelectric effect, that little tiny waves of high energy, of high frequency, of short wavelength have the energy that will kick the electrons out of the metal, out of the system with the highest kinetic energy. So the photoelectric effect gives us the wave-particle duality. That is, light behaves not only as a wave, it does, it travels in waves, but it appears to travel as a stream of little quantum particles, little packets of energy that we call photons.